everybody to this video. It is more of a podcast video. This is an orchids and story time. <laughs> Seeing as the weather is so diabolical, I am not going to be able to do much with my orchids. I am not able to unpot them, repot them, clean them up. Something I prefer to do while I'm doing orchids and stories. So keeping us company is Dendrobium nobile variety Cooksonianum which was a gift from Fernanda Nacimento Orchids and Succulents. Thank you, Fernanda, for this gorgeous orchid. I am able to use her for my story because today we are going by ship from Mombasa to Dubai. Michael McCarthy, I was really hoping to be able to do this while I was messing around with an orchid, but it is not possible. So there will be some images from Google Earth interspersed into this video just for orientation purposes. <laughs> Right, other than that, let's get to it. If you're new to my channel, welcome. If you're familiar with orchids and stories, welcome back. I hope that you enjoy this episode. Just a little nugget on the side. I was born and raised in Africa, Kenya, and Mombasa to be specific. Went to school there, graduated there, all that good stuff that you do up to the age of 18. And my father was the captain of a cement ship. The company is a German company and they had a whole fleet of cement ships that would take cement from Mombasa to Dubai on the regular because back in those days, in the late 70s and 80s, Dubai was nothing but a sliver of yellow sand coming up out of the Persian Gulf. In those days, the UAE already knew that their oil would be running out and they were thinking ahead and they were already starting to plan for the future of what we see today. I hope I'm not gonna go off on any tangents, but it can happen, so that is my disclaimer. Anyway, during the age of seven to 13, sometimes I was 15, sometimes 18, but mainly during the age of 7 to 13, my dad would take me on all his trips from Mombasa to Dubai and back, seeing as it was like a three-week round trip. Five to six days going, five to six days back, and discharging the vessel in Dubai. My dad was also my tutor, so I was out of school more than I was in school. And if anybody is wondering about exams and how did I manage that? Well, if an exam were to coincide with one of his trips and I was nowhere near close to Mombasa, we would make sure that there was another vessel headed in the other direction and I would be transferred to that vessel and back to Mombasa in time for my exams and then when he came back into port <laughs> I was back on his ship. Anyway the story that I'm about to talk about is a specific one. There are very many similarities because I did this trip so much, but on this specific one, something happened that I would like to include and we're gonna go from start to finish. But first of all, let me give you some orientation. Mombasa town itself is on an island surrounded by a creek. Two entryways, the port on the left is the big port, the huge commercial port. The port on the right called English Point that is the port that my dad would come into and that was solely for the purpose of loading cement. The vessel would come in empty and would leave full and it was just a rotor, a constant rotor. The east coast of Kenya used to be an ancient reef so there are cement quarries everywhere. Not very visible to the eye right now on Google because a friend of ours, Mr. Halla, made that into a national park, which is another story. Anyway, yes, every time I say which is another story, please let me know if you want to hear it in the comments. <laughs> Trust me, I don't find them boring, but you know, I am not the judge of that. So when I say, oh, and that is another story, just let me know in the comments if you want to hear it. But anyway, Mombasa is an island. There's a creek that sort of splits into a Y shape and well, Mombasa town is on that, connected by bridges. And I lived off in a little area called Nyali and we were assigned an apartment by the cement company, an apartment block that was not far away from my dad's silos. Port. If I use words interchangeably, I just want to make sure the silos are right by the port where my dad would load up the ship. I was within walking distance of those silos and then I would leave my apartment block and go and walk to where my dad's ship was. Sometimes he knew I was coming, sometimes he didn't know I was coming. It was fun to be able to just walk around the little back lanes to get to the silos and then just appear and, you know, go up to his cabin and say, hi, <laughs> I'm here or even wait for his ship to come in and for that gangway to finally be lowered and then we can get to the ship. Anyway, so that's just for orientation purposes. I did a lot of walking, 
back and forth through the trails in the back. And the only open field that was really there at the time was that exhibition field. And in that area with the apartment blocks is where I talk about attaching orchids to trees. And off to the right, there's a whole cluster of little homes that I can see that they are still exactly the same as when I was there. Some of those homes were the friends of mine that had orchids growing in trees, and that is where I got my first divisions from. Anyway, if you want an orientation about my little hunting grounds in that area and the village to the left, the authentic African village that's there off to the left, I used to be in that village a lot. I would climb the wall of our property <laughs> and just hang out in that village. Anyway, story time, let's get back to the subject matter. My dad returned from a maiden voyage. He used to go to Germany a lot and be there to supervise the building of a new cement ship. And he would be gone a whole year in doing that. And then he would sail the ship down maiden voyage to Mombasa where it would be loaded up. And you know, now the ship was in commission. But the arrival of any new ship into its first port of call always requires a party dignitaries would come and you know everybody is excited about this new ship so we have the maiden voyage party at night the day after the arrival of the ship and the ship is already being loaded up so no time is wasted at all and all the cement ships in this fleet were bulk there was no sandbag carrying on and off it was all pumped in by cement powder in bulk We'd have cement trucks coming in, they would load up the silos and the silos would then pump the powdered cement straight into the holding tanks. And of course you start with one side and then gently move to the other side so the ship is never really out of kilter but there is a bit of a lean every once in a while based on which section of the ship is being loaded. And the way they did that, they had these huge heavy duty black black pipes that would be bolted down to the deck of the ship after loading and after discharging, but they would be massive and they would be held by a crane in place and connected to the pipes that lead to the silos and then connected to the tanks as we were filling up the ship. So they were suspended in the air. Everything is cool. And oh, yes, by the way, this was in December in the heat of Kenya summer. And of course, you can imagine the pressure of that cement being pumped and pushed through those massive black tubes would cause them to move around a little bit. Not much, just a little bit. But there is a give because there's a lot of pressure and the tubes would be piping hot because of the heat created as the cement goes through, including the heat of the African sun. But anyway, the ship had arrived. It was beautiful. It was the biggest one my dad ever, ever sailed in his little fleet there. And she was called Floria. My dad's ships were all named in alphabetical order. So there was Aspia, Bamburi, Cementia, Dahlia, Elbia, and Floria. So that was like six ships that he supervised, built and sailed down. And Floria was the biggest one of them all. But anyway, gorgeous spanking ship. We have white decks, white railings, and the hull was painted gray. And of course the red line, the water line was all red. And she was the first ship that I saw that had the bulb in the front. It was so cool. The whole facade and the structure of the ship, the cabins, etc., everything was white. And this ship came with a swimming pool. <laughs> no way. Awesome. Well, not because my dad needed a swimming pool on the ship, but as of a certain tonnage, I don't know, some kind of legislation requires that there be a swimming pool on a ship, but this was way cool. But the swimming pool was in the poop deck. Anywho, so we were loading up the ship and then the next day it was the maiden voyage party and we would get diplomats in and everything. And I was in the cabin with my dad, kind of getting ready or almost ready and he looked Oh, I loved it when he put on his whites, you know, his captain's hat and the lapels, the black and the gold with the stripes being the captain, his white polished shoes. He looked so good. And then there was a phone call <laughs> into the cabin and there was a very animated, excited voice at the end that I couldn't understand. And my dad looked out of the window and he saw a plume of smoke, what looked like a plume of smoke, but it wasn't. It was cement leaking from the black tubes while it was being pumped onto the ship. Needless to say, he hung up quickly and called the silos to stop the pumping immediately because there is a problem. Something had gone horribly wrong. Nobody had heard an explosion. It wasn't like there was a big ripping sound in the air, but 
we had a plume of gray dust. By the time the silos had shut down and the pressure had reduced, the ship was covered in a cloud of gray dust and the port authorities had already sent a firefighting boat over to us. And when my dad realized it wasn't actually a fire and what had happened, he radioed very, very quickly to that boat to say, do not switch your water on. Do not switch your water on because <laughs> we know what happens when water comes in contact with powdered cement. My dad was extremely pedantic and fussy about his ship. It didn't matter just because it was the maiden voyage that his ship was super clean and spanking sparkling in the sunshine on the great seas. He wanted his ship to look like that whether it was five years old or ten years old. You always knew which ship was under Captain Peter Bosse because it was clean. And this was a massive horror situation for my dad. Obviously, seeing as there wasn't a fire, at least there was that. But the cement is covering the entire ship. On the afternoon prior to the maiden voyage party, when in the poop deck, everything was being prepared for the drinks, the buffet, they banned. Everything was being prepared back there. And we have this gray cloud of dust all around us. My dad was horrified. I could see his gorgeous tanned face and those blue, blue eyes that he had just going pale. He didn't know what to do at that point in time. There is nothing you can do because that dust settles very, very slowly. The pressure will first push it into the air and then it's going to take forever to settle down. At least he got the fire tugboat to stop spraying water. There's nothing he could do. Anyway, it was such a shame to see him so proud of his new ship and then see this happening. What had happened was that one of those big black tubes had torn or had disconnected from the connection that was supposed to be super, super tight. The heat of the sun, the heat of the cement pumping through there had caused a weak link to open up and we don't know how many hundreds of kilograms of cement actually went into the air. Anyway, everybody was saying, let's get some brooms, let's get some brooms. And my dad says, it's pointless. Every time you sweep, an hour later, it'll be done again. We'll just have to wait this out. But then the real disaster struck. We don't have rain from at least end of October to mid-March, end of March. That is the summer in Kenya. The rainy season starts end of March through April, you know, and into June, July. And then you only get spurts of torrential rain. You don't get the long rain that we know elsewhere in the world. So it wasn't like we were worried about that, but it started to drizzle. I don't, I can't, I just couldn't. It, we had just stopped the tug from pouring water on us to avoid what's going to come next. And then it started to drizzle. And let me tell you something. They say when it rains, it pours. Not exactly. It drizzled. If we had had a typical tropical deluge, it wouldn't have been bad. Most of the cement wouldn't have combined and do what cement does when it comes into contact with water because the torrential rain would have been much heavier than any amount of cement we had on deck and it would have cleared the atmosphere pretty quickly as well. But no, it drizzled and that light drizzle caused all the dust that was on the facade, on the deck, well, everywhere around the ship to have just enough water in it for the cement to become crusty and hardened. Remember I told you at the beginning that the ship was being loaded up in certain sections, but it's not always flat because of where the cement was being loaded at what point in time. So there was a section by the gangway, which was all draped nicely in the Kenyan colors. There was a section of the gangway that was a little bit lower than the other side of the ship where the gangway wasn't and where all the guests and dignitaries were not going to walk. No, they were going to come on to the deck at the lowest point at that time. And that was where things were accumulating fast with any water falling on deck was starting to pool in and around that area. It was like, oh my word. Now it was time to get out the brooms and any squidgies that we had on hand. My dad couldn't touch anything because he only had one set of whites that had been pressed. So he had to stand on a railing, not touch anything, and he was bossing everybody around. I mean, I had a great time just getting dug in. I'm not one to be in some kind of a girly little dress. I was, I was a real tomboy. So I got a broom and everybody else, we started to push 
any of the cement sludge into the lowest part of the ship. As long as we could clear the area where the gangway was meeting the deck of the ship, and then moving up the stairs to get all the guests to the poop deck. I am telling you, what a mess. And then of course the rain stopped. And then we had to get the hoses out, high pressure hoses, and we just kept pushing whatever was on the deck, clearing at least the area that you could see on the deck free of the dust and the rain, just to make sure that we could wash as much of it off so that not more crusties, as I'm gonna call them, were able to develop in a certain part of the deck without ruining the hull as well. It was, anyway, we got that taken care of. At least the railing was clean at that part. The stairs were clean leading up to the part. The whole landing area between the front of the deck all the way to the poop deck, that was cleaned. So the pathway for the guests was cleaned and thankfully the party only started as the sun was setting. So you couldn't really see what had happened and it wasn't that obvious when the ship's lights were on. The white glowed more than anything else that could possibly destroy the visual of his new ship. The party went well, everything was fantastic. That was actually the party there I met Kofi Annan. That's another story. <laughs> Okay, it was during the summer holidays, December, summer. I have, to, I have to say it like that because I wasn't at school and it was the summer holidays. Anyway, next day, the full horror of what had occurred was obvious. He walked the ship and he was like always muttering, muttering, muttering. There are some German swear words. <laughs> But anyway, we were leaving. The thing was, though, that by the time we should arrive in Dubai, that ship needed to be cleaned. Now, my dad always did maintenance work on the ship at sea. It was never without. There was always a battle plan, so to speak, as to what needs to be done in order to keep the ship maintained. So it wasn't it wasn't out of the norm that we were going to be cleaning the ship and all that business. What was out of the norm is what we were dealing with. We first had to get the cement off any surfaces of the ship. The only way of doing that was to have a scraper in your hand and meticulously go after each little crusty individually. Some came off relatively easy and others didn't, so you had to scrape a little harder. Scraping a little harder also removed the white coating of paint, exposing the next layer underneath, which was green. And if it was a really tough job, you went all the way to the antioxidant protection paint, which was orange. Exposing any of these areas would invite rust. My dad hated rust. If he had any pet peeve about being at sea, it was rust and it was dealt with the moment we would leave port. And he seemed to have a catalog of areas that were rust prone and he made sure even around the anchor areas, there was never any kind of yellow lines. He would always <laughs> poo poo other ships when he saw the yellow lines around the anchors. He says, my ship doesn't have that. <laughs> Anyway, and then, of course, all that dust was all the way up by the funnel, which was black, blue, and a mustard yellow and white. So it was hands on deck, literally. There was a skeleton crew at the bridge and the rest of us were assigned to areas. I was under the supervision of the bosun as per usual. And you know what they did with me? <laughs> they suspended me from the top where the funnel deck is because I was the lightest. It was safer for me than to have a grown person do this. I had an outrigger thing where I could sit on and they suspended me in a harness <laughs> with my scraper tied around my wrist so I wouldn't drop it on the next guy below me who would be working from, let's say, ground floor up and we would then eventually meet in the middle. And I got to scrape the facade of the ship. <laughs> I'm telling you, my dad was a great dad. <laughs> I was never, I never felt under threat when he told me to do something. I was like, okay. And I wasn't afraid of heights. And that's the thing. My dad was afraid of heights. Shame. Anyway, before I had to get to that point, though, it was always so nice to leave the port because, you know, the generators of the ship would allow for a certain hum and activity under your feet. There were always vibrations under your feet when the ship was in port. But when it got really going, it was so exciting for me. It was like, here we go. We're off, you know. 
but we were always facing in the opposite direction of the entrance to the port. Because when the ship came in, that was it. That was where the pipes were to connect for loading. And then we would have to pretty much push ourselves away using the bow thrusters and maneuver ourselves in such a way that now the ship is facing towards the exit entrance of the port. Now we had Mombasa town to our right, where all the dows were, and the silos to our left, and we were heading out to open sea. Before we get to the open sea, though, we passed a very, very old fort called Fort Jesus that was on the right, and the Mombasa Club, where I used to hang out between lunches from school because it was always too much traffic going from the island home. So I used to hang out at this Mombasa Club, which we called Chini Club because it was so low. They had a saltwater swimming pool there. So that's the Chini Club on the right. That's also more stories there. But anyway, heading out to see the next building that would come up would be the hospital where I was born. That's the Mombasa Hospital. It used to be called the Catherine Bibi Hospital. I was born there and that one is on the right. And there was also one trip I couldn't join my dad because it also coincided with me having appendicitis and getting it taken out. So one day, the day after the operation, I went to the balcony of my hospital room and my dad was sailing by and he gave me three horns in salute. Oh my goodness. Waved from the bridge. I waved back. I could see he had his binoculars and I just waved and I just, oh, when he gave those three horns of salute to me, I was like, oh, I'm still getting goosebumps today. Oh, anyway. Yeah, so that was the hospital that you would then see on the right. And then pretty much we were already out of the protected area. And that is when the ship would start to respond to the waves. It would start to roll. Oh, that was heaven for me. A lot of people got seasick, even the crew. <laughs> they would come up to the bridge. Some people said, no, I can't make it. They haven't got their sea legs yet. And I never understood that because I never felt seasick ever. And my dad once told me it's probably because you were on the bridge all the time. And that is where you should be when you get seasick and not cooped up in a cabin just because you're not feeling well. You need to go somewhere as high as possible. And if you can't get to the bridge or whatever, go somewhere outside and let your eyes follow the motion of the waves so that your brain feels like it is steady and there is nothing going on. The moment you go into an enclosed space and you're not feeling well, that is when the brain cannot associate what is going on and that's why you get seasick. So, well, I never had the problem, I guess. Maybe there's some truth to that when you're up on the bridge, seeing as I've been up on the bridge all the time and then after a couple of hours I would go down. But anyway, and of course, departure and entry to the port had to coincide with high tide and usually we would leave late afternoon around 6 p.m because that was when the tide is at its highest point during some seasons and early mornings would be the arrival because that is when the tide is at its highest point as well anyway it was dinner time and then it was bedtime and i was always assigned the hospital room that was another cool thing about the ship on the floor where my dad's cabin was on the opposite side through the hallway there was the hospital room for any eventualities, even if there were cases of, of something that needed some quarantine, etc. And my dad turned out to be the doctor of the ship as well. So all the funky stuff that was happening, it all happened in the infirmary. Anyway, I had my hospital suite, so to speak. Two beds were in there with an ensuite bathroom. And there was one bed that was tucked in by the wall. It was stable. And then there was another bed that was on two posts that if you unhooked it, it would swing and roll with the movement of the ship. Well, I never slept in that bed. I liked the feeling of the ship rolling. I loved going to bed, lying down, and then my body moving with the movement of the ship. I thoroughly enjoyed that. Anyway, so next morning, breakfast, and then there was this plan of attack, so to speak. The ship cleanup had to begin. It had to happen, and it was a very orchestrated affair because we needed to be looking all smart and fancy when we arrived in Dubai. <laughs> and I was suspended into this harness and up I went and started to scrape away at all the crusties that were on the facade. And eventually I would meet, you know, halfway with the person from below coming up. So that was day one. And the instructions were very, very clear. Take your time, but hurry up. <laughs> Don't skip. Don't, you know, like my dad would say, don't rush things. Don't think that any minute spec wasn't important because eventually even that minute spec 
would become a problem if we one day just paint the ship entirely and we paint over hard cement. Eventually it will be brittle and then peel off through the elements and then we start exposing the underside of the paint job, get into the steel and you know, rust would form. Anyway, hurry up, but don't rush. Okay, that was the first day. The second day, same thing, but this time with orange paint, the rust protection paint. It was orange and I looked a mess afterwards because despite the fact I had my bucket of paint and my paintbrush, every time you lift it up, even if you are cleaning the brush up against the tin, the moment you lift it up, it was precarious because you didn't want to add to your workload for the next coating because, you know, the streaks of paint in the wind would go and splat against the facade. Oh, what a nightmare. I looked a mess. <laughs> I was, I was, yeah, anyway. So orange coating went on. That happened relatively quickly, but you need two coats. So in the morning, we did the orange coat. And then in the afternoon, as it had dried off, we did the second coat of orange. And then the third morning, it was the green coat that went on. I don't know why that paint had to go on. I don't remember that, the reason for the green coat, but a green coating had to go on. By now, the ship looked like a clown car. If you were at the bow of the ship and you looked back, it looked horrendous. I cannot imagine the relief my dad felt as the ship was getting these different coats of paint on, but the horror he must have had to see his ship look the way it did. It looked horrible. But that's the reason being at high sea, nobody can really tell. <laughs> <laughs> so the green coat went on in the morning of the third day, if I remember correctly, if I'm keeping my timeline on track. And then the white coat went on in the afternoon. But because the green coat was darker than the white coat, <laughs> yes, you guessed it, another coat had to go on. And then on the fourth day prior to arrival, there was like a check of the ship from different angles, but also in different light. So early morning light, full sun daylight, <laughs> <laughs> early evening, late evening light to see how the two coats of paint had covered up the green because, you know, you don't want any darker patches to be showing up. Oh my goodness. It's, it, it was a thing. It was a whole thing. But anyway, by day four, the ship was looking fabulous again with the exception of that one area there that had accumulated all the cement sludge in that one corner in the first day when we then took to the water hose. There was still all the incrustations because that had actually turned out to be a thick layer of just pure gray cement. So what they were trying to do was take some press hammers and chisels, trying to break through that layer of cement to get to the real deck in order to treat paint, etc. But what was happening was that some areas were harder than others. Things weren't coming off evenly. It started to look really, really bad. It was like a pockmarked area and my dad was having conniptions day four, this is not happening, this is not working. So the solution was in that area then to, to actually take cement, mix it up, smooth everything over, let it dry and just paint white over it because it was just too hard to get off. Now, if you didn't know what had happened in that area, you wouldn't really see the uneven levels at all. But it was obvious to everybody else that knew what had happened, that that corner of the ship, that area, it wasn't actually level with the deck, but it was was done in such a way that it worked out that you couldn't see any of the rough edges of the cement but the irony here we are spending so much time getting rid of the stuff and all of a sudden we're mixing it up and pouring it over an area just to do a cover-up oh anyway the ship was back in ship shape let's put it that way my dad was somewhat happy and we arrived in Dubai in Dubai is a little bit yeah we didn't actually arrive in Dubai we we arrived next to Dubai because there was nothing to arrive to the creek is like a sand filled kind of access area and it wasn't dredged out for any kind of industrial ship at all. But there was piping from land to some silos on land all the way out to the ocean where we went to anchor and then up go the black tubes again and we started to discharge our ship. You usually take about three to four days depending on how quickly it can be done. So we never really went into any port, but we used to take the by boat out and go to shore, which was an adventure in itself. 
I absolutely loved going up the creek in my dad's by boat, going to the Medina, going to the souk, going to the gold souk. Oh my goodness. And that is where I've got this bracelet from that you see in the videos. I got two bracelets, one when I was 11 and one when I was 14. And I never took them off. So my hand grew around them. The one that I had when I was 11, unfortunately snapped. The gold had, had become a little bit weak on one point. I still have it. I still want to make a bracelet out of it at some point when I can afford to do so, but it snapped. So I'm left with only one, which is actually really bizarre because I always had this little bit of clinking, clinking sound. I've been so used to everything clinking sound and now my hand is silent. But anyway, yeah, we used to go on land and it was the dates and everything. Let me just tell you the adventure of Dubai at that point in time. Now, when I went back every year in January, I would go back to Dubai and see its progress and development. I can still pick out the older sites, but it's pretty much, you have to really look for them. They've changed so much around the creek area where they took the little diesel smelly boats from one side of the creek to the Dara side of the creek. Yeah, I loved it. Oh, and then, <laughs> <laughs> because we were so busy at sea getting the ship ready to look nice when we arrived at Dubai, next to Dubai, we never did the fire drill, which is compulsory, especially on the first commercial sail from A to B. So it was fire drill time while we were at anchor in Dubai, and that's another whole... <laughs> <laughs> the reason you do it while you're at sea is for the reason why we... Anyway, that's another story. <laughs> But yeah, one thing I do want to add, despite the fact that we were so busy on this trip, but I'm gonna combine it in this video, was the wildlife. The wildlife at sea is something that is just marvelous. I was in paradise. I knew when the flying fish started, I knew where to start looking out for whales, and I knew when the dolphins would come out to play. And it was just a wonderful time because as you leave the port of Mombasa, you're still hugging the coastline to a degree before you pull out. And no, there was no piracy at the time either. Now the whole fleet is armed with security personnel. But at the time, as you come off the coast of Somalia, it, there's, there was none of that going on. But the flying fish would start just when you started to distance yourself from the coast and you started to pull into open waters. <laughs> I'm telling you, they're not flying fish in the sense of flapping their wings and being able to go left, right and cruise around you and avoid an object in the way. No, they fly out of the water. They have a very straight trajectory. And if you are in the way, you will get slapped by one of them. And that hurts. They're tough little critters. It's not like <laughs> it's not a slimy thing. These things are built to be airborne. So that was another thing that we also did a lot was to make sure that we helped the flying fish back into the waters because when the ships were a bit smaller, the flying fish could actually cover the distance from one side of the deck and cross over in a straight line. Now you have a bigger ship with a bigger hull and the deck is much longer. You got fish that actually started coming out of the water onto the deck and didn't cover the full distance. So they were flapping around and they would die if we didn't throw them back into the water. That was also part and parcel of what we used to do. Anybody working on deck was to make sure that if they can help a flying fish get back into water, help them because they don't open their wings and fly off. They would literally just die and cook on the hot steel deck. But dang, when one hit you and you didn't see it coming, whoa, that hurt. <laughs> <laughs> it reminds me of an Asterix and Obelix cartoon where they're always slapping each other with fish. <laughs> anyway, so the flying fish would be around as you distance yourself from the Kenyan or the East African coast. And then as you were coming closer to Socotra, by the way, Socotra, that is where the dragon's blood is harvested from. Yes, I never got to touch foot on Socotra, but yep, there it is. As you got closer to Socotra, that's when the whales would start and you would be able to see them when they empty their blowholes. Now, they weren't exactly around the ship. Literally, you would have to look into the horizon and check for blowholes because they would be far away and they would move away from the ship. It's not us sailing through them. They don't want anything remotely to do with the ship at all. 
the sonar, the propeller, and all of that. It, they don't like that sound. It interferes with their communications. But when you could see the blowholes, that was then the time to go onto the bridge, grab the binoculars, and start looking, because it would be maybe one, then you would see four, and then it would be 20. And you knew that you were in the middle of a pod or several pods, and they were just majestic to say the least. So from the island of Socotra all the way, as you come up to the east coast of the Arabian Peninsula, there would be whales. I don't know which whales they were, maybe just blue whales, I'm not sure. Not the orcas or anything like that. I never got close enough and I don't remember if my dad told me, and I don't remember that he told me, but whales nonetheless, and it was just so nice to see them. So plotting my way through the Indian Ocean, I didn't just learn it from the charts that my dad taught me, taught me to read the stars with a sextant. I wasn't allowed to use that computer yet, which is another story, but I was taught to read the stars, plot the course, via a sextant and then you did the cross and the circle and you drew the straight line just to make sure that the autopilot is doing what it's doing but yeah that was awesome as well but i plotted the indian ocean based on the wildlife that i saw i mean the birds got less and less the albatross didn't appear as much the further out into the ocean you got and that depended on the time of year as well but having said all that when you passed socotra and got up more closer to the arabian peninsula the dolphins started the dolphins, oh you guys, sitting at the bow of the ship with the bulb now there, because before we didn't have that bulb, this ship was big enough to need a bulb. Oh my goodness, they would come and they would play with the bulb. They would jump. They, it's so difficult to describe these creatures. A, they are so fast because they are leading the ship, so to speak. When they jump, they have a twist that takes them off to the right or to the left, depending, but at least they'd be out of the way because by the time they landed in the water, they wouldn't be hitting the ship. These creatures are amazing to watch. And there would be so many of them. It wasn't like just a pair of them. No, you could see them coming in and taking turns and then they would ride the waves that the ship created all the way to the back and then they would come forward again. They were just having a blast with what the ship was doing. And then you would see mums with their little calves under their fins also enjoying the waves. Oh my goodness, it was such a treat. And literally, you know, like the Titanic, you have that little like fence section you can step up to and then you can stand there and observe. And I would sit down, let my feet dangle over. And the best part was if the ship was full, we would be lower into the ocean, so much closer to them as well. So when they jumped, they literally jumped to eye level. Ah, oh, I cannot tell you what a treat that was. It was so much fun. And I've spent hours out there. At least, you know, I could be out there alone. Everything was okay. When I think back, there was such a freedom back then, and I wasn't like tied with a harness. I just sat with my feet dangling over the edge. My dad had me in his line of vision. Sometimes he would be with me, but it wasn't like somebody was around me all the time, making sure that I don't fall overboard. There was such an atmosphere of common sense that was instilled in me. So I never had a problem being in and around the ship alone. So if anybody's thinking, well, that was dangerous. Well, I didn't see it that way. And I don't know how I would be if it was my children doing that. And I would be busy doing my work on the ship. I don't know how I would feel about it. But back then there was such a freedom and it was so much fun. And eventually I got my own binoculars as well. Instead of always having to run up to the bridge to stand on the port or starboard side of the bridge to watch the wildlife, I finally got my own binoculars that I could hang around my neck. Not the big ones, the adult ones, but my dad bought me some that were more to my size that wouldn't make me walk around hunchback. <laughs> oh, you guys, I cannot tell you how beautiful it was with those turquoise waters that were a little bit more turquoise now, the dark blue waters had gone. The sand of the Arabian Peninsula would also, you know, change the color of the water and then see the dolphins. It was just awesome. But anyway, we went from Mombasa to Dubai and I don't know how long this video is, but um, let me tell you something. If you want to hear about more of my stories, you need to let me know in the comments because it is sometimes difficult to go back and reminisce on these times because I am not that person in the stories anymore. They are great memories, 
happy memories, but they're also very painful memories because, well, because life. I don't know how to describe it when I call them painful. I don't know how to describe it, but if you are enjoying this, then, you know, any story that I have, I could go off on a tangent. Let me know in the comments. I'll be very, very happy to be a little bit more consistent with these stories. If you're okay with the fact that I don't have that many pictures of my time in Kenya, which is a shame. I know where they are. I just don't have access to them for reasons. But I hope that me recounting what I'm saying has been of some help so that you can use your imagination and plus with some Google Earth images. I don't know. I don't know, Just, you need to let me know how you feel about it. And if narration is okay for you, podcast style is fine, then I'm gonna do more of these on a more regular basis instead of waiting to get my hands into an orchid when I can't. Anyway, I leave that up to you to let me know. I appreciate your time very much. If you sat through and listened to this, unconventional as it is, I appreciate that you stuck through and joined me on my journey from Mombasa to Dubai. Thank you so much have yourselves a beautiful beautiful day on one condition though as always that you stay safe take care bye mm -hmm.